You are listening to episode number 14 of the Farmer's Market Podcast. On today's show, Lisa Mason Ziegler of the Gardener's Workshop explains soil blocks and what it all means for your plants and vegetables. Plus, she's got an amazing offer for all the listeners out there, and you'll hear her best lesson in life and how it's helped her become a successful author, entrepreneur, and gardener for decades. Be sure to subscribe to this show right now so you'll get updated on the latest and greatest episode. But for right now, let's get started. Get ready for this. Wow, I am blown away by the response I've been getting on Facebook. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Upstate's Farmer's Market Podcast. The following program is for adult audiences only. You are listening to... Hey y'all, thanks for having me on the Farmer's Market Podcast. Relax and enjoy. We are one of the few tea growing farms in the United States. Hi, this is Chris Thurman from Bioway Farm. Hi, this is Kristen with Earth and Organics. Hi, this is Mark Jones from Cedar Falls Farm. Thanks for listening. And now your host. Great day, everybody. My name is Stefan, and you're listening to the Farmer's Market Podcast, the show that talks to farmers, homesteaders, beekeepers, small business owners, and much, much more. We are proudly based here in the upstate of South Carolina, where we keep it fresh and we keep it local. Here we talk about all things farmers market related. Now, be sure to subscribe to the show on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and of course, YouTube, and become a supporter of SEAFarms.com. That's the home base for my farm online and, of course, the home of the Farmers Market Podcast. Please share with all your friends on Facebook and across all of your social networks, link, comment, And of course, you can share anytime you want. And let me know if there's a local farmer or a local business that you would like to hear on the show. Now, today's guest, I am honored. She has a wealth of experience both in growing flowers and vegetables. She's authored several books, including her latest title, Vegetables Love Flowers. Now, what a great title. Uh, It's a book about planting the two together to grow a bountiful garden. She offers online workshops and has been seen at workshops throughout the United States. Welcome to the show, Lisa Mason Ziegler of the Gardener's Workshop. Hey, thanks, Stefan. Glad to be here. Well, we're glad to have you. Now, did I say your name right? Please tell me I said your name. You did. All right. (laughs) You did. Just want to make sure. (laughs) I Uh, pretty much answer to anything. If you get it close enough, that's good for me. Right. No, people do the same thing with me. They say Stefan. They say Stephen. And I'm like, it's fine. It's whatever. It begins with an S. Yeah. Uh, So we are glad to have you on the show. Now, you can find Lisa and the Gardener's Workshop at thegardenersworkshop.com. And, of course, on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Now, I first saw Lisa doing a demo and a video demonstration on soil blocking, and that's what caught my attention. So I immediately reached out to her to see if she would be on the sh- on the show. Now, you've been doing this for quite a while, and I know a little bit about you because I've done some background research, and we talked a little bit. Can you share with our listeners kind of how you got started? Give us the dirt on Lisa and how you got started with the Gardener's Workshop. Sure. So I have been a commercial flower farmer for 21 years, and I was actually a pretty novice gardener um, when I just happened to read the book, The Flower Farmer. And um, as you can often hear people say, and the rest is history, I'm kind of a gardener gone wild. Um, (laughs) I just loved, you know, I just really loved gardening, and then I happened to meet this guy that came with this great piece of land, and he was a big gardener, and he came with dump trucks and tillers, so it looked like the story was already written, and I just kind of (laughs) fell in love with gardening, and um, back 20 years ago, flower farming is a growing industry. We're taking the domestic American market back, slowly but surely, but back 20 years ago, um, there were so few commercial flower farmers, so I was a hit overnight. I was a success from the beginning, and um, the, the the kind of tweak in my problem is that I'm an urban farmer. I'm in the middle of the city. Right. Um, I'm the last commercial farmer in what was a very large Mennonite farming community, and um, the city doesn't quite know what to do with you when you're the last <laughs> of something. So we just make lemonade out of lemons. I can't right, have any right. structures. You know, and I don't have any hoop houses or any greenhouses. I do everything out in the field, start transplants in this big building that's like a garage on racks and grow lights. 
And, you know, as we've already mentioned soil blocking a little bit, I would not be farming today without soil blocking because of its space savviness. Um, I kind of tweaked it into a tabletop method, um, the way that I practice it, and it allows me to start tens of thousands of seedlings in a very small space indoors. And um, I just... Love what I do. So, uh, Love sharing. I'm an educa- I've become an educator. Yeah, college. there's, no, there's really? no doubt about that because the videos you have are, like, very detailed and you're very down to earth when, you, when you're explaining things, which is good for some of us, including myself. Now, you, let's back up just a little bit. You're, give us a lay of the land. You, you mentioned you don't have any hoop houses. You have a, a somewhat of a garage. But give us, like, what's the square footage? I mean, how much space do you have to move around in? Sure. Sure. So my whole property is um, a little less than three acres. On that three acres, about an acre and a half is in working garden, and that includes our vegetables and our flower production. During our um, high production years, which was up till about three years ago, we did it hard for about 12 years. We produced about ten to 15,000 stems of flowers oh a week. Gosh. From this space, and I mean, we of course we're not certified organic, but we follow all organic, right, you know, natural right. practices. Um, so this building that I work from, and the building came about four years after I started farming in '98. About four years in, I had I just knew that I, I was doing everything off of my carport, literally <laughs> off of. I was starting seeds in the basement of my home. Oh, and we've I was all in a bungalow. we've done that. We've all done that. I think. <laughs> Isn't it true? And it's like you just, the more success you have, it's like, holy cow, where am I going to start? I mean, I had seeds starting all over everywhere. Anyway, so I built this building, which is a rather large building. It's 30 by 36. It's two floors, and it's got two big carports, um, one on each end in addition. And, um, you know, we have big garage doors on it. And in this building, um, which also has a restroom, I have a 10 by 10, what I call a grow room. And it's a room that faces southeast and has floor-to-ceiling almost windows. But I have multiple rolling racks in there with shelving and grow lights on them. And that little 10 by 10 room can support 13,000 seedlings, small soil blocks at one given time. Oh, my gosh. Wow. So- and that's the secret. <laughs> okay, so you're, you're, you're devout. You're like soil blocks, that's it. You don't do plugs at all? No, I do. There is, I mean, I'm not a purist in anything I do in life, okay? <laughs> right, right, right. I do what works, what is the most economically wise choice, um, and what is the quickest and the fastest to get where I need to go. And so we do do some plug trays. I mean, we start hundreds of, we pl- currently plant about 500 sunflowers every week for 26 weeks. Well, we could never soil block them. Right, There's not right. enough time in the day. So we do do plug trays. And then there's a few other things that we plug tray. Um, but I would say the majority of our production is in, and I use the small three-quarter inch soil block, which is different than most everybody else. Um, and I was forced to do that because I didn't have any space. Yeah, that's the tiny one for blockers. those out there. Yeah, that's the really, really small one. Yeah, and I learned that it's all about timing, that you can make that work. We start our tomatoes, our peppers, our lettuce, our herbs, our flowers. If the seed is not too big to go into that block, then that's what we use. And they grow so fast um, that we find that we only start, like, for instance, zinnias. We plant them when they're two weeks old because you can handle a small block at two weeks old easily and plant it. Um, So it's all about timing not starting too early, um, and we just, we've gotten it down to a science. And as you mentioned earlier, you can plant soil blocks so much quicker oh, yeah. than plug tray. Yeah, that, that's what I'm finding I out mean, is it's, it's, it's one half dozen the other. Either you save time on the front end or you save it on the back end. And I know when yeah. I'm, go ahead, you, you were going to say. I was going to say, we're pretty quick soil block makers and seed, seed sowers. You know, and then you never touch it again. You never thin. You never pot it up. Um, so I feel like for us, um, and of course we've been doing it for 20 years, we're very quick. Um, so, But of course if you're using a vacuum seeder on plug trays, right. that's quick. We're right. not that quick. But for the small, I mean my real niche 
for me, and I feel like it's the niche of most people that want to have a small market farm is, you know, we're not looking to plant two acres. We're looking to plant a half to one acre. Right. And we need to find ways to make it affordable, make it, you know, you don't want to have to build a bunch of structures or even for me, I'm glad I can't have hoop houses. I love that my farm is beautiful. Right. Do you know what I mean? There's no oh, yeah. hoop houses anywhere. Um, and so it's just, a, you know, a different walk, a different path and a little more economical, not quite as scary when the snowstorms come or the hurricanes come, you know, about houses being, you know, airlifted. Right. But, well, tell, so you tell, just figure it out. Tell, tell us a little bit about, you mentioned the science, you, you got to figure out because of spacing. Tell, tell us a little bit about the science behind the soil block. I mean, I know there's tons of videos out there and there's tons of information on the web, but just from you, I mean, you've authored a couple of books, but what what is the science behind that little tiny block and why it's, sure. I, I believe it's the most beneficial way to basically start a, a plant, whether it be a vegetable yeah. or a flower. And if you have any doubt, you just read Elliot Coleman's books, and he will back it up with scientific information, and that's who I learned it from. And um, I actually was a struggling wannabe farmer when I read his book, The New, I think it's The New Organic Market Grower, and it was just revised, um, and that's the greatest book ever. And I read that book based on a recommendation from the person that wrote The Flower Farmer, and I started reading about soil blocking, and it made perfectly good sense to me. The plants are never in a container, so they don't get root-bound. Their roots get actually air-pruned. And, yes, they will definitely grow into their neighbor if you leave them too long, which we do on a regular basis <laughs> as a farmer, even a gardener. Who right. does anything right exactly when you're supposed to, right? Right, right. And... So, but I find that its continued growth into its neighbor just means that we're literally breaking blocks apart as we're planting them, and it the effect on the plant is not the same as untangling those long, wrapped roots that you get when a plant is in a container. Even I mean, after like two days, they start to wrap. Right. So the story is that because the roots get so much oxygen is why they grow so much quicker than a plant in a container. I mean, the soil dries out quicker, which I find is a benefit. We water every morning. And I, that room that I spoke of gets up to over 100 degrees during the day. So it's very similar to growing in a greenhouse. Oh, wow. And I only water once a day because I water very thoroughly, which... I probably speak more about that step of soil blocking, helping people that are struggling. Um, but that science of you totally wet the block and then it gets totally dry in a 24-hour period eliminates mold and algae that I hear people oh, struggle with, yes. which we have no problem with. Um, your room, your temperatures aren't warm enough if you're having that problem. But the plants just tend to grow quicker. And in addition to that, because you can handle soil blocks earlier, think of a plug tray. Think of, let's just, we, we suffer from this every week. We start, as I mentioned, sunflowers in plug trays. We have to let those sunflowers get a little more root bound than I want them to be so that we can get them out of the plug tray without breaking the stem off of the roots, right? Plus, the roots have to hold the soil together. Right. Well, soil block, that's not the case at all. First off, the roots just really spread throughout the block very quickly. And the blocking mix recipe that we use, and it's on our website, that is Elliot's recipe, is made to bind together. It's not made to be crumbly like potting soil. Right. So in addition to them growing a little faster, you can handle those blocks so much younger. So, you know, I mean, we're out there planting right now three- to four-week-old celosias and a lot of the flower, a big part of our crops, that most people wait until they're six to eight weeks old. We get them in the ground earlier. We don't have them growing inside or longer. I mean, just, it's just easier all the way around for us. 
Wow. That, and that's amazing. It is. I mean, the soil block technique, you have that component of it. Then you have the watering component. And then you also have the mix component. And see what I'm, I'm yep. I mean, I've only been into this two years now. And when I first started, I, I, that's exactly what I did. I followed Elliot Coleman. I, I have the mix recipe actually listed on my big five gallon buckets. So when, <laughs> so I mean, mixing, I, yeah. yes, yes. It's like parts, this parts, that parts, that, and I've got it all written out on like three of the, the five gallon buckets I have in the barn. And, and what I'm finding out this year, I, I said, you know, I need to experiment to make sure that maybe a pre-mix thing, or maybe I'll try a little bit of uh, this verma compost and see if this does better. What I'm finding out is that mix that Elliot Coleman, the recipe, is the best one so far. Because last year, I, yeah. I, I didn't have things breaking apart. Um, the plugs are a nightmare uh, for me this year. I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's just the, the whole soil composition is just breaking apart on me. Um, I even tried a little bit of the vermiculite to, to try to do that as far as the germination. And I'm still finding out, for, for the plugs, that is, um, I'm still finding out the soil blocks with that standard composition mix of soil and the right watering. Now, I will say my timing, my timing is a little off. And you said that it, it is all about timing. How do you gauge that, especially when you have, let's say, new seed from from a new vendor or provider um, and you're just trying to figure out how do you gauge the timing of it? From once that seed decides, okay, it's germinating, now I've got my seedling, how do you decide to go from the soil block and then transplant it? Okay. So what I generally tell people, because everybody's growing environment conditions are different, Right. I suggest to people, instead of saying it's three to four weeks old, I say I'm looking for a three to five inch high plant right. because I might get that three to five inches in three weeks because my room's warm and I have great, you know, I have figured out the steps. Whereas if you're growing in a cooler situation, it'll take longer. Um, so what I would say to you, and I counsel, oh my goodness, I mean, I talk to people so much about that's a struggle. People don't realize that for growth, to, that's the benefit of a greenhouse. Greenhouses are naturally warm because of sunshine, right? Right. When people are growing indoors like I am, if you don't provide for a way for that room, I mean, that room cannot be 65 degrees and expect warm season tender annuals or even cool season annuals. They all need heat to grow vegetation, right? Right. So you have to have some warmth to your air temperature to after your seeds have sprouted to make them continue to grow. Um, so for me, I always, I just um, did a special bonus training. I do an online flower farming school, and as I am knee-deep, we did it like my first time around was this last fall. And as we are knee-deep in seed starting now, I had to stop the other day, and we made an extra hour bonus training we added to their library because so many things doing it every day, it's like, oh, my goodness, I've got to tell them about this right, and about right, that. Right. And the biggest thing that I have learned over the years, and it is hard for people to resist this, <laughs> is I always err on starting later rather than earlier. Really? Because, they, oh, let me tell you something. Because, and it's true in vegetables and in flowers. But first, what I want to say is there is nothing more torturous than watching gorgeous transplants that should be planted this week or in the next 10 days. But guess what? You started so early, it is still too cold outside, and you are not going to be able to plant. And you watch them. I don't care what, what you bump them up to. First off, that is hugely labor. We don't bump anything up except for tomatoes and peppers. That's the only thing we ever bump up because we love having a larger transplant. Right. It, the, the intense labor involved in bumping up, in my opinion, is a huge waste of labor and money. That is interesting. We almost okay. ditch them and start over again. Um, it's easier to do that, and you have a better plant in the end. Um, so, But the reality is 
in flowers, and it's true in vegetables. There are as many cool season vegetables and flowers right. that you should be heavily involved with now, especially because you're in South Carolina. I'm in Virginia, even though I sound like I'm from Georgia. <laughs> um, we can grow cool season annuals of vegetables and flowers all winter, pretty right. much. I mean, I'm not You're talking right. about necessarily in flowers, not harvesting, but in vegetables you can. Oh, yeah. If you are heavily engaged in embracing cool season farming and gardening, you don't feel like you have to push the envelope on getting your warm season stuff started right. earlier than you should. That's the point. We are so overcome. One of my books is um, Cool Flowers. It's all about cool season um annual stuff like snapdragons and sweet peas and bells of ireland and most of us in the south should plant those babies in the fall to be our first spring blooms we are so overcome in harvesting flowers in april and may we hardly have time to get our warm season stuff started so that kind of fixed our problem we're not chomping at the bit to start our zinnias and coxcomb when we really shouldn't because we're too busy cutting snapdragons and right. you know cool season stuff so it's it's it all almost kind of works together it's almost getting back to what nature had intended i mean it it, it hey i mean it's kind of hit crazy. the nail on the head you hit the nail on the head i it's i you know i i, I hear you because i i'm and I'm not a, you know, I haven't, like I said, I'm not an experienced farmer by any stretch, but I, I still feel the pressure of, okay, got to have all these things at the first market, got to have all these things ready to go. I mean, I, I was talking to my wife and my kids and I'm telling them, yeah, I'm getting ready for February. I've got to start planting seeds. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that's, that's crazy. <laughs> so, yeah. But, but the, it's true. And it's so true. And now I'm not saying that and first off I just wanted to interject here my book vegetables love flowers is really not a lot about vegetables right. it's about how flowers benefit yes. vegetables by bringing in pollinators yes and we're going to talk about insects. that yes but but the, the whole theme that book is my heart it is the big picture of gardening and farming, about embracing seasonality, about figuring that out, how to garden without pesticides, even organics. and But that really helps people. It shows you how to succession plant. It has diagrams. Anyway, so I understand it took me, I bet I was farming 12 years before somebody struck me in the head with a, you know, a hammer and said, wake up, right? grow with the seasons, it is so much easier. It is less expensive. It is far healthier. <laughs> right. And it's just so much e- – and there's so much great stuff. Oh, yeah. No, my – Grow. When, when we're eating, my wife will say we, we're really supposed to eat these vegetables in the fall. And I went, what? What do you mean? And she'll tell me. Yep. I mean, she really tells me. And it's like I didn't – I never really connected the two, but we're so – it, it it's part of this pressure to always have variety and all these things. And it's really yep. not the way it was supposed to be set up, but I, the, yeah, could, you're so right. I, it's, it's amazing. And, and the more you get back into nature, you start to go, okay, this makes a lot of sense. People talk about um, no spray and pesticides and all this. And I tell people, I don't spray. I, the only thing I spray is water. Um, I try to yeah. get nets over my plants. I try to get nets over my vegetables. And if the squash bug comes in and it destroys a plant, that's what nature had intended for it. To, I mean, I did my best, but it got it. Right. You know, <laughs> that's just right. no squash right. this week. <laughs> You know, and we also, I mean, now that we're in a global world, it's like we call them food sins. Right. (laughs) That's called eating out of season. Yes. It's like, why are you eating a strawberry at Christmas? Do you know what I mean? And now I am of such a way that I do it. You know, I mean, we're as I mentioned, I am not a purist by any stretch of the imagination. But we really try to embrace, I mean, we can and freeze and do all those things to, you know, help our winners. But the real joy is eating the seasons, and it's the same with flowers. You know, once when our ladies and customers love the spring flowers, but, man, the minute it gets hot, they're ready for sunflowers and zinnias and coxcombs. Right. They don't want to ever see another snapdragon. Oh, yeah. You no, know? And that's exactly right. So, 
That's exactly yeah, right. Well, let me let me ask you a little bit because you you mentioned the flowers and the combination with the vegetables and and how you speak about they they kind of work together and that's I, I didn't realize that I, I went to a couple of farms. We did a farm tour here in in South Carolina. I went to a couple of farms and I started noticing flowers pretty much everywhere. And I went to one farm down in City Roots or uh, down in Columbia called City Roots, and that's the one that really caught my eye because they were doing both a flower CSA and a vegetable CSA. And I started asking them more about this flower CSA and they said, well, it's, it's very low on the, on the revenue scale, but the flowers benefit the pollination of the, you know, with the bees and they bring in the insects that help the pollination of our cucumbers, of our tomatoes. Explain yep. that dynamic because I think, I, I know experienced market gardeners get that and I know a lot of people get that, but just for the average everyday person that likes to plant things outside and grow their own vegetables, explain that dynamic just a little bit. Sure, sure. So, you know, if you want to be an organic farmer or gardener, um, and you're not planting at least 20% flower presence in your vegetable patch, um, it's virtually impossible to do um, without intervention of organic products, which we don't use. Um, so, you know, na- nature's pollinators and beneficial insects, beneficial insects are bugs that eat other bugs, and there are far more beneficial insects on the planet than there are pests that actually cause problems to our plants. And when I was, um, first start, first few years, I was not an organic gardener. I did like everybody else. And, you know, back 20 years ago, only hippies were organic gardeners, <laughs> right, right? Right, right, You know, I mean, it just wasn't as today. And um, so we just didn't realize what harm we were doing by using even organic products affect beneficial insects. So I kind of walked away from organic products for a lot of reasons, which I explained that whole sweet story in Vegetables Love Flowers. And all of a sudden, after over two years, which is about how long it takes for you to restore the natural order to your garden, I watched my garden come alive. I all of a sudden noticed that the pests that I had been fighting really were not a problem anymore. We had a low, I mean, we would have pockets of problems, but Nature just kind of beneficial insects um, and wildlife would actually help us take care of that. And pollination, you know, you want abundant tomatoes and bigger tomatoes and better quality tomatoes. You need black bumblebees in your garden. And how, why would a, why would a pollinator, let's just say bees, not honeybees, but native bees, why would they even come to your garden right. if you don't have flowers? Right. You know what it's like? It's like if you invited me to your home, to stay a week, but you only fed me on Monday, <laughs> I wouldn't be hanging around very long. You know, by Tuesday morning at about 11 o'clock, I'd be thinking about, you know, bolting from your home. Well, it depends on the and relative. that's what happens. <laughs> you know? On. I mean, yeah. that's what happens. Why, why, would veg, why would these good guys, pollinators, come to our gardens? Yes, bees, I mean, beans bloom and peas bloom. But we need more than the right. occasional visitor. We need a strong presence, and flowers are the ticket. And, um, you yeah. know, it's just flower farmers really know that better than anybody because we are overrun with them. Well, and some, yeah, well, and some of the farms, the, the bigger farms, they have uh, on-site beehives and beekeepers. That, that's all they do is they make sure the bees are, are doing their thing because they're the yeah. pollinators for the flowers and, and they're bringing it over to the vegetables. It's, a, it's this symbiotic relationship with all of these things, and it's all nature-driven. It's not, you know, manufacturing. It's not coming in with, you know, uh, you know all these machines and trying to figure it out. It's it's really a remarkable thing. Um, well, let me, I know you don't have a whole lot of, I'm, I'm glad you gave me the time. I know you don't have a whole lot of time, um, but because you're about to do a Facebook Live, because you do these all the time, um, and, and I know on your website, you've got a plethora of things. You've, I believe you've got everything you could possibly need to do the soil blocking, correct? Yes, we do sell the soil, blo- soil blocking equipment, and we also sell grow lights and heat mats, and um, the recipe is on there. I mean, that's just something you can look up to make your own, or we sell it ready-made, and everything you need for soil blocking, um, the tools and all the steps and the support system to get them out to the garden, row covers, um, everything that the a gardener would need or a farmer. 
and and even more so on your website I, and and listeners you got to you got to go to the website um because you have more than just the stuff you have what I would call you've got the information. I mean, you actually explain how to use these things and you do it in such a detailed manner. Now, I know you mentioned earlier in the pre-show call um, something about an offer. So what is it for our listeners that you have available sure. for them? Sure. So our, um, I'm really an educator and we do offer sell stuff on our website and we really only sell the things that I use. We use we sell the soil blockers and a couple of tools, the hand hoe and the stand-up hoe that I adore, which are also Elliot Coleman's um, stand-up hoe design. And But our website is packed with videos and blogs and just endless information, as well as my online courses. And so what we have an offer for your listeners um, is a promotion code to give you 20% off of any tools, seed starting equipment or seeds. It's not good on books or online courses. Um, and the promotion code is farmer. And, um, you know, we just hope that you'll that you know, awesome. have a go and have a look around and sign up for our farm news. And we send a lot of educational information, not nearly enough salesy information. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what I mean? It's like we're not really retailers. We just just sell the stuff that we use, and um, because that's what people really, um, really, really, really want. Yeah, you, the site is amazing. And like I, I, when I did my searches, I, I ran across your videos. And the next thing you know, you know, you you, you do the rabbit trail thing. You go, okay, well, where where is this at? Oh, this is the oh the workshop. Oh, you've got a website. Oh, wait a minute, you've got this, and you, and you start kind of yeah. you feel like a kid it's in a candy true. store. <laughs> you really do. You're like, it's oh, true. I, I didn't know this I, existed. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so we have a great learning center where we try to help people find their way. We have tons of soil blocking information. I have an online course, Seed, seed Starting Made Easy, which is like 20 bucks. Everything you need to know about soil blocking, showing you how to do it, as well as to start seeds out in the garden. The entire course, the seed gardening course, is 20 bucks. That's it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. Seed gosh. Starting Made Easy. Yeah, it's, a, it's I think it's 80 minutes long. And it's me showing you how to make blocks, how to support blocks, the whole nine yards, and then to start seeds also out in the garden. Yeah, it's a deal. Oh, my no gosh. Doubt. Oh, my goodness. Well, I know the listeners are going to take advantage of that offer because, I mean, I'm, I'm going to probably. Because uh, <laughs> can I do? I don't know if I can do that technically. But anyway, <laughs> well, let me. You, you've done a ton of stuff in your life. I mean, not only from gardening, but basically running a business to running now doing the digital thing um, with Facebook. And, and obviously you're still writing. I, I don't know how you have time to do hardly any of these things. You're still kicking out massive amounts of, of production, both on the flower side and the vegetable side. Now, I always do this kind of towards the end of the show where I find out a little bit more about Lisa. And I was hoping you could share like one or two things that you've learned maybe about life or about your business that you'd like to share. Maybe it was a lesson um, or a challenge or a hardship uh, that you, you thought, you know what, that was a great life lesson. Is there something, you know, just life threw at you that you would like to share with the listeners? Sure, sure. So I probably would say that the the best lesson that I have learned, and it took me a long time to learn it, I will admit, is that starting small, building your wisdom before you invest a lot of money, um, and finding your path. And you do not have to, if you're a farmer, you do not have to provide vegetables or flowers for the world. You just need to find your little niche and um, when I embraced what I'm doing, I, I tend to be a little overzealous type person, right. and I do I jump in too deep, and I almost I mean you get burnt out. Your family gets burnt out, even though they're very supportive. You know how many years can they have you absent from their life? And so for me, the truest thing is why do what we love if it's all you do? If you have no life beyond that. And so my big goal these last few years and a lot about what I teach is how to do this, to do what you love, and make it a part of your life, not make it your life. And to benefit your family, you know, you need to line your pockets with a little bit of income. That's the point of being in business. 
right? And to do it in a way that you can still take your kids on vacation <laughs> or, do you know what I mean, to right. walk away from your business. At, you know, I walk across the driveway at 4 o'clock on most days and don't look back, even though it's right outside my window. Right. No, so, that, that, is, that is so sound advice. Called, yeah. That, that is awesome. Yeah, it's sound advice, and I, I would echo all of that and then some. And I, like I said, I haven't been doing farming nearly as long as you have, but I am quickly realizing the more I talk to farmers and the more I talk to just local small businesses, you start to go, is this, is this really, do I want to spend my entire life doing just this or do i want to make it a part of my life which you said so eloquently um lisa i want to thank you for being on the show i know you've got a whirlwind schedule lined up especially during the growing season i want to thank you for sharing the gardener's workshop with us today i really do appreciate it it has been my pleasure and i really appreciate being a part of it Now, everybody, you guys got to go out and check out the Gardener's Workshop online and share this episode with everybody you know. You can like, you can comment, and again, share it across Facebook. Now, your support as a listener is key. And most importantly, support your local farms and farmers. Until the next time, my name is Stefan, and you've been listening to the Farmer's Market Podcast. If you haven't already, subscribe on iTunes. And while you're there, please leave us a rating and review.